Namaste Sharashwati Deve Gauda Bani Pachani and Yuri says a Sneevani Pishati. So in discussing this subject with my wife, we we of course we have experience with this, but we isolated, I think, three areas. One area is that we may make the assumption that we're incompatible when we're actually not incompatible. So um, it was definitely important to talk about that because that can be a common mistake. Then uh, an, another, uh, uh, okay, but if you're actually incompatible, it's, it's objectively a fact. You have sufficient experience, every astrologer told you and you know, it's just, okay, there's an obvious incompatibility. How do you deal with that? And the third one, I can't think of right now. I was just thinking a minute ago. Um, using, oh yeah, the third one is using the incompatibility incompat in our advantage. Because we're different, we see things differently and that, that can give us a broader vision. You know, so sometimes when you agree on everything, it limits you. So those were the three areas we wanted to discuss. So what we have till like what, 545, is that it? Or, and then questions for 15 minutes, is that the program? Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, I believe maybe we should go until 550 and give 10 minutes uh, uh, time for questions, if that is okay. Well, we'll see how it goes. And anybody can ask a question anytime and then either we'll We'll take the question if we feel it's relevant to the topic at that point, or we will wait to the end. And sometimes when I see questions, I just address it in the, in the talk. So I think first, it's extremely important that we determine why we would think we're incompatible when we may not be. Like what standards are we using to determine compatib compatibility, incompatibility. You want to say something on that? Because that's, you can say better on that. Well, everyone has a different definition or standard of what incompatibility means. But in general, we would understand it to mean that cer several things like, um, you know, I don't like the way they do that. I don't like the way they say that. Um, I wish they were more like me. Um, you know, it's it's the fact that that person doesn't do things that please you or serve you or sit right with you. And you generally wish that they were more like you. Um, but just using the term incompatible is kind of an excuse, or it can be an excuse for um, not stepping up to the plate to be kind and considerate and respectful yourself. And, you know, taking the first step to think more about their needs instead of wishing and waiting for them to change. So that's when we think of incompatibility, we're just think, thinking that if they just did things the way you did them, that everything would be fine. And they're probably thinking the same thing. So it's a way to avoid um, you know, being more respectful and considerate and kind and um, not being able to communicate in a way that both of you feel heard and understood. And it's, it's like what Janova was saying, I can expand, expand on that. If you just, you want to talk to him, go out, outside and talk to him because they think he wants to come over. If you just believe what I believe, 
then everything would just be fine, right? I, I, I don't agree with you. If you just agree with me, we'll get along fine. Or, you know, you can extend that. Well, if, you know, I don't like what you like, but if you just like what I like, we would get along fine. And, you know, you can think of so many things. And, and what my wife, uh, another thing that she, she was alluding to, but she didn't exactly point out, is that sometimes we don't like someone simply because they don't think like we do. And we don't introspect about that reality. Like, like, why don't you like this person? Like, because he likes red and I like blue. That's, and that's a very superficial reason not to like someone, obviously. But we have many super, superficial reasons why we don't like somebody. So like she was saying, we can write it off as incompatibility, but we can also introspect and say, okay, What's going on inside of me that this person is disturbing me? And so we come to the conclusion that, um, oh, well, he's disturbing me because he doesn't think like I think or believe what I believe or have the same taste that I have. And that's, that's not a good reason to not like somebody. So as you introspect, you start asking rather than what's wrong with them What's wrong with me that I that I see somebody different and then I label it incompatible? Well, we don't get along well because he likes red, I like blue. She likes red, I like blue. So have you ever had that experience that you just don't like somebody because they're very conservative and you're very liberal? Or you're very conservative and they're very liberal? Conservatives and liberals exist everywhere. And if we're going to develop a community, we have to be able to transcend these kinds of differences by, I could say, maturing, growing, becoming, or my, as my wife said, more respectful, bigger, better, so that even though we may disagree with someone, we can still be very appreciative of them. It's just, you have a different view. I don't see it that way. But is that going to be the deal breaker for the relationship? If it is, that's a very immature way of dealing with someone, don't you think? So that's why when we were asked to give this class, when we looked at the word incompatibility, incompatible, um, then we were thinking, wait a minute, who's defining <laughs> incompatibility? What's your standard? And and like my wife is saying, if you just define it as incompatible, that's easy because then you don't have to do anything. It's just incompatible. So, you know, I mean. Now, the other thing that I said, the third thing, when it's incompatible, okay, he likes red, I like blue. But maybe red is better in this context than blue. But I should be open to considering that. So if I say incompatible, I'm not open to considering it. Red is bad. It's always bad, always was, always will be. But if I'm opening to consider, well, maybe red is good in some situations and maybe I'm wrong, you know? So sometimes that's hard to come to because I just dislike this other person's view on something or their mode of operandus or whatever. And it's hard for me to say, wait a minute, well, maybe they have something to say. And this is why, this is why in mediation, what a, a mediator will do sometimes is ask you to take the point of view of the other side. So let's say my wife likes red, I like blue. She's telling me why red is so fantastic. I'm telling her why red is so bad and blue is so much better. The mediator says to me, okay, Mahatma, now I want you to explain why red is so great. And okay, Janava, I want you to explain why blue is so great. Just to like, can you actually do that? And I think for some people that's really hard to do. Uh, uh, red is, but red isn't great. Now just try to understand why she thinks it's great. And so you have to start putting yourself in their shoes, being empathic, being respectful, being open. Okay, why would she like red? Let me try to understand that. And in our forgiveness workshop, we ask people, 
to, to put on the shoes of the person who abused them and try to understand why do you think they did that? You think because they're crazy or they're horrible or they're abusive. No, no, no. Go deeper. Why do you think? Why do you think they became that way? What do you think in their life history has caused them to be this way? It's a more compassionate view. And then you start to understand what makes them tick. And isn't that interesting that you can call someone an abuser and at the end of the workshop, you call them a teacher or you don't see them that way anymore because you've gone so much into their world. So that's why this is so important before we label something incompatible. We've got to look at ourselves and say, well, am I so closed that I can't understand this person? I don't want to understand this person. This person upsets me. So that's, that's super important. Um, I actually never really used the word incompatible until I became a devotee. <laughs> I don't think I never, ever used that word. And um, I now I look at the word, and even as a devotee, I always really saw the word, use the word in reference to people getting married, right? That's always how I thought of the word as, you know, are they compatible in terms of uh, matrimony? And I'm having a little bit of a hard time um, using it outside of that reference. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it's the same thing as saying they don't get along. Yeah, basically. Yeah. And it just really keeps coming back to the same point for me as a marriage counselor and mediator for couples um, that when people don't get along, it's because they're not willing to understand the other person's point of view. And when they can understand the person's point of view, like Mahatma Prabhu is saying, when you understand what make, makes a person tick, why they are the way they are, what's the background that they come from, why do they have those beliefs, then, um, you know, everything changes. You don't see them quite the same way that you did before, even if you don't agree with what, how they think or what they believe or even what they do, but because you understand their frailties or the term we use is, um, uh, what's that term? Um, endurable vulnerability, enduring vulnerability. So we all have personality quirks, right? And things about us that are kind of annoying or um, we come from backgrounds where we may have been through some kind of difficulty or trauma or trouble, challenge, or, you know, our parents had this kind of paradigm, which unfortunately, you know, came into our, and we took on that paradigm, even though we didn't consciously want to. So these are kind of what we call enduring vulnerabilities. They're things about us that aren't maybe the best, but when you choose to respect somebody and you understand their enduring vulnerabilities, then you're willing to overlook them and you're willing to focus on the things about them that you appreciate or that you can appreciate, be them ever so small, you know, the way they chant nice japa or the way they attend the program when they can or the way they're um, they cook, make putties, or the way they take care of their children, or the way they're very nice to this person or that person, or the way they keep their car clean. I don't know. You've got to look for something, some positive qualities about that person that can sort of change your view on them. And instead of looking at those enduring vulnerabilities, you start to have a, a positive sentiment attitude towards them. And at the same time, cultivate this mood of compassion and understanding and, um, you know, agree to disagree. Uni unity and diversity. It's not a perfect world and it will never be. And we have to think how to get along with everybody, even the people that have enduring vulnerabilities that may annoy us or bug us or disturb us. I want to speak about two things. One is the strategy 
for getting along, if there actually is an incompatibility or you think there is, once, once you've done all the other strategies, if you still think, well, actually, we are quite different. So as Jonavis says, you could make it positive, even though you're different, by appreciating what's good. I just, I think it's important to just speak a little bit about criticism, and then I will speak about some strategies for working together, because I think that's really the focus of this as a community, working together as a community. But it's important to understand that a lot of the criticisms we levy at other people are autobiographical. And I think a lot of you understand that. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, I think Bhakti Vinod Thakur has said, because I'm so honeycombed with faults, I see the faults of others. And uh, psychology has taught, taught us this for many years. It's only what is unhealed and disturbing to me that disturbs me when I see it in another person. So there's, as conditioned soul, there's a tendency to blame people. And the reason blame is toxic is number one, it's offensive. Number two, it lacks, we're not taking responsibility. We're blaming another person for our feelings and then consequently our actions. But the irony of it is we may be seeing our own fault in them. It may be just a mirror. And as I was saying before, we need some introspection. So if there is a problem and I can say, well, actually the problem is with me. It's not with them. I'm just seeing my own fault in them. And I'm blaming them because I don't want to take responsibility for it. Because if I blame you for how I feel, I, you make me really angry. You, you are the cause of my anger. So I'm not responsible for controlling my anger or you make me whatever. You make me not want to cooperate with you. You make me want to be independent. But nobody can make me anything. It's, it's, it's coming for me and I'm blaming you because you're just a catalyst for awakening something bad in me. And I've been talking about this for many, many years, but I just came up with an analogy, which I think will really help us. You know, you have, you have, what do they call these waters? Like, you know, there's just a slight fragrance of a vegetable or a fruit in the water, right? But you could also have an odor water as well, right? You could, you could create odor water, you know, like you could put the, the um, excrement or, or whatever the skunk squirts out, whatever you call it, you could put that in the container and put water in it. You can imagine how there, you could put excrement of an animal. Or you could put a little drop of orange, a little drop of lemon, a little drop of rose. And so we are, we are being, water is being put in us by what's happening around us. And we are responding with some lemon, some orange, or some skunk, right? So when great devotees, are in difficult situations, they take those difficulties and they scent them with something beautiful. And that's what comes out of them. Like compassion or kindness or understanding comes out of them. But often when we're in the same situation, odors come out of us in the form of anger or resentment or so forth. So I think it's really important when you're in a community, in relationships, you don't blame people for how you're responding, because I know it seems like they trigger you, and I know it seems like it's their fault. But you could take what they're throwing at you, put it through your consciousness, and it could come out as this beautiful tangerine lemon scented water. It doesn't have to come out as some stale odor. So I think that's really important to understand if you're gonna have a healthy community, because the more we are critical, it's a sign that we're actually self-critical. We're not satisfied with ourselves. There's something we feel is wrong with us and we're disturbed and we see it in other people. And so again, that, in, well, we're incompatible because you know he always makes me angry or this or that. Um, we have to really understand it on a deeper level, okay? So now we can take it 
we can take it one level further of how are we going to get along? Because even if we're not incompatible, let's say while I'm progressing and understanding how to become compatible, I see incompatibility. Maybe I could make it more compatible. Maybe I can't. So we're going to deal with it's incompatible. A beautiful thought is to always be goal or object oriented. What is the goal of our community? What is the goal of this project? What is the goal of what we're trying to do? And how can the conflict between us interfere with that goal? So, and or and or thinking, how is my attitude in this situation, this incompatible situation, and how I'm thinking, how I'm dealing with this person, how is that attitude either helping or hindering what we want to achieve? Because when you talk about unity and diversity, you have to know what the goal is. What are you united around? What are you trying to achieve? Because if we're very clear about what we're trying to achieve, then I can determine in my response to this incompatible situation, if I'm supportive of it, if I'm helping it, if we're, if by my behavior, words, attitudes, and so forth, we're getting closer or we're getting further away because many of us have a very strong need to be right. True or true? Thank you. Yes, it's true. And many of us find it difficult to admit we're wrong. Many of us find it difficult to apologize. But we have to ask ourselves, knowing the goal of the community and knowing that I'm dealing with some incompatible relationships, what is the behavior that I must adopt that will help all of us move forward in what it is we're trying to achieve? Because if I'm just attached to being right, great. You know, I can walk out of the temple being right and I can feel great. I'm right. And the project goes downhill. So you you want it, you want the gratification of being right at the loss of the sobriety and development of the project or the community. So I think those are important thoughts in, in creating unity and diversity. What is it that you're unified towards? What's the goal and how is your behavior working towards that goal? So if I have to say, okay, this person I'm incompatible with, um, can we can give deference to his strategy, his preferences, his ideas, because if I try to push my ideas, even though I think they're right or better, I can see it's gonna create some kind of tension here and it's not gonna help us get closer to our goals. So that's one very humble way of dealing with incompatibility. Um, so here's a few remedies or antidotes to this feeling of being incompatible with somebody aka not liking them, aka not getting along with them, aka having tension and conflict with them. So here are some just simple, tangible, um, evidence-based practices that you can do. And you might not want to do them, right? Because, you know, there's some resistance. But if you do them, you will feel better and they will feel better. And um, the dynamics and the energy of the relationship will change, and then you can accomplish your goal. So here's a few a few things. One is, um, so these are like this is like assignments or homework for you. Okay, so I don't, I'm not going to be checking up on you, but Krishna will. So one is, I want you to think of everybody that you have some kind of tense or um, strained relationship with, and it's, it's interfering with your life to some degree. And I want you to come up with three appreciations of them. And that means something they did or do, something or a quality about them. Um, so for instance, you know, thank you for 
um, doing that A, B, and C. I really appreciate it. Or I love the way you did that. That was so thoughtful of you. Or, um, you know, that was so great the way you led that kirtan or, um, you know, wow, your son did really did your son so polite and nice. You've really raised him well, or, or, um, or, though you sing like a frog, I really appreciate your sincerity. That was a joke, right? But it's a realistic, but I don't think you would say the frog part. Cause I think, no, no it's because sometimes <laughs> We can't, we, we have to get past what we don't appreciate to appreciate. Well, you can say you sung really good no, today. <laughs> okay. That. I'm saying. Yeah. I'm saying in my mind thinking, yeah. you know, like someone does something and it's like, ah, oh, yeah. they always do it that way, but I can see they're sincere. And so then you focus, I mean, I'm a musician. So if someone sings like a frog, it's really hard to get beyond it. But um we have to look at the sincerity. It's so sincere. So, so, so that's just realistic. I mean, that's real life. All right. So with my couples, I do three appreciations. You can just do one. I think three is overboard. So one appreciation. And again, it's, and you don't have to say it to their face. You could send them a text. You could send them an email. You could send them a letter. You could send them a note, anything, but they have to know about it. It's not enough just to think it. You have to express it so they know about it. So one appreciation about something about them, something they do, something they did, anything. Then another um, remedy or antidote for these feelings of negativity, which manifest in all kinds of ways that are actually very unhealthy for us. You know, you may be thinking, oh, they're this and they're that. And I, they're so rude and disrespectful. And, you know, and you think that they have the problem, but just the fact that you're thinking about them that way, it's your problem now. And it's affecting your heart in a negative way. So the damage, you may be judging them for some damage you think they've caused, but actually you're causing more damage to yourself. So are we still on? So, um, right. So this is a, a, a true tested practice and that is to serve them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I learned this when I lived in an ashram many years ago in the ladies ashram that, you know, the, there are always little conflicts between some of us ladies so the we knew how to remedy it it was to serve them so we would leave plates of maha for them and without them knowing who it was or we would fold their laundry and they didn't know who it was but we'd find ways to do anonymous things for the girls that we envied or the girls that you know did something that made us angry and it always worked mm -hmm. and i think this is it's it's um, recommended in Shastra too. So do some service. So I'll leave that up to your imagination, what you can do for them, any little thing. And they can know about it, but they don't have to know about it. So the appreciation and let them know, so express it in some way and do some service for them as well. And I had one more, but I can't think of it right now. So um, yeah. Give them gifts? No? Yeah, but. Well, the six loving exchanges always help. Oh, yeah. yeah. There you go. Um, hmm. I, I want to talk about a little bit about how Prabhupada said we should deal with envy. Because envy is really one of the main qualifications for taking birth in the material world. And the main qualification for staying here. And the main qualification for getting out of here is to become non-envious, which it, it kind of works in a circular way. If you love Krishna, you're not envious. But you can't love Krishna if you're envious. So it's, you've got to work, work it from the beginning. So Prabhupada explained how we deal with this, and I, I think it's so important and, and, and so insightful the way Prabhupada explained it, because where there's envy amongst devotees, it obviously 
erodes relationships and erodes community. And uh, the brothers and sisters of envy come as prejudice. We don't like someone because wrong color, wrong gender, wrong race, wrong caste. I mean, you know, this this goes deep, deep into the heart. We are, we are raised not just Indians, we as Americans were also raised. We have our own castes here in America, it's just not pronounced by religion, by color. Uh, then you get cast by neighborhood, by occupation, by the car you drive. Oh, he's in the Lexus caste and I'm in the Corolla caste. Oh, he's, you know. So, you know, it, it's all pervasive. So uh, when we see somebody and we're feeling this envy towards them. Prabhupada said something very insightful. He said, you should understand that if you're envious of someone, it's actually a sign of respect. We don't, we don't like people when we become envious of them because they're more successful than we are. Sometimes that makes us feel unsuccessful to see a successful person. We don't like that. We make, you make me feel bad. Why do I make you feel bad? Because you're so successful. And I'm not. So, so Prabhupada said, actually, it's a sign of respect because you envy the person that you want to be like. I don't think in your life you have ever envied a garbage collector. Raise your hand if you've ever envied a garbage collector. Okay, we've got, let's count the hands. We've got, uh, let's see what we got here. We've got zero, zero, zero. Okay. We haven't got anyone who's envied a garbage collector. Hmm. Why haven't you envied a garbage collector? Because... Hare, Hare Krishna, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> I would you say have. I would envy I would envy the garbage collector if, if he or she were humble, kind, oh. like always grateful and like happy in life, actually liked his job or her job, was kind to people. I would admire, I would admire that person. Okay, I totally understand. But have you ever <laughs> envied a garbage collector yet? <laughs> have, have you met one that you've envied? You, no, you understand yeah, what I I'm guess saying. I wasn't, yeah, yeah, I wasn't really thinking about an envy, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but you understand, understand the point is that the people we envy are the people we respect. So you could respect a garbage collector. You know, it was just generally people don't, so I use that example. So once you understand, then you think of this in a different way. You say, actually, I really respect this devotee because they're so successful. And so Prabhupada said, you should serve them. You should support them. And there's an insight to this, which is very, very interesting. Let's say you want to be a writer and one of, your, one of the devotees in our movement has become very successful as a writer. And you're, you're feeling envy. No, I want to be that successful. The reality is that when you serve that person, when you appreciate that person, you're in a much better position to be successful as a writer than if you envy them because envy is negative. And so now this person has achieved something that you would like to achieve, but you have negativity towards the person who achieved what you wanted. So how are you going to achieve something if it's surrounded by negativity? Isn't that interesting? So it, it's, it's important if you can switch it around, if you feel envy and realize actually it's a sign of respect and then manifest that respect. And then as far as prejudice, well, maybe we're getting a little bit off the topic of incompatibility, but these are, these are factors which can create incompatibility in some situations. As far as prejudice, it is, and prejudice and more, more specifically being judgmental. It, it is something that is likely, more likely to happen in an environment where people are expected to be more pure. But I want to tell you something really funny. I mean, you know this, you know, after you became a devotee, you're like you expect more from people because they're devotees. You know, and, and before you're a devotee, you're, you ask your friend, what did you do? 
on the weekend. He said, well, we went to the party and then we went to the pub. Then we went to the movie. You don't say, oh, you're so much in Maya. You know, you don't judge them. You think, oh, you had fun because you don't have a high standard with which to judge. Now you become a devotee, you have a very high standard. There's more to condemn, isn't it? So um, we need we need to at least understand that that that's gonna that's gonna come up. It's gonna challenge us, and um, I forgot my train of thought. Give me a second. I think I think my train of thought was awareness within a religious organization of the tendency to be more judgmental of people based on things we learned before we were devotee and plus based on expectations of devotees to be a certain way. And just like Jonava nicely said, you know, if you're judging or criticizing someone, then where's the real fault? The real fault isn't the person making the accusation, isn't it? So if I'm judging someone, being extremely critical, condescending, where is the real problem? The real problem's with me. So it goes back to this point. If we recognize these things about ourselves, if we're introspective, if we look at them and say, oh, I am being unfairly judgmental rather than being more, um, what I would say, maybe magnanimous, generous, the word, more generous in in how I see people. And we were talking last night in a class about something really funny, that often we we expect people to be very advanced and we and if they're not, we become upset with them. Why are you doing that? You shouldn't do that, that's not good. We kind of become condescending. But then as we're saying, then when they become advanced, we become envious. So it's like, I don't want you to be more advanced than me. I don't want you to be less advanced than me. Then I kind of put you down. And I, you know, when we're equal, then now you're competing with me. So it's, you can get yourself in a trap where you're envious of people of you. And you're kind of impatient with people under you. You should be more advanced and a little bit competitive with people equal to you because, well, maybe they'll outdo me. Maybe they'll do better than me. So if we're aware of this, it's very important. And one last thing, is which was very dramatic for me in my devotional service was I noticed that the less I was self-accepting of myself, the more I was hard on myself, the more I was hard on others, the more I was critical on others. And the more I'm self-accepting of myself, the more I'm self-accepting of others. So when Janava is saying, you know, you have to look at the fact that if you're critical, judgmental, not appreciative and so forth, where's the real problem lying? And it, it may lie in a reality that I'm treating myself with impatience. I'm treating myself with negative judgment. I'm being very self-critical. I'm even envious of myself in a sense. And now it's, it's coming back on other people. And as we began speaking about incompatibility, that's not really incompatibility, but it's, it's these things within me that are creating this kind of toxic connection with people because I haven't been enough, I haven't been self-accepting. And there may be actually no incompatibility at all. Once I become compatible and accepting with myself, then it happens more easily with other people. You want to say something? Yeah. Um, what I was thinking about is that when we find fault with other people, you know, we hone in on certain things about them that bother us or that we don't like, that rub us the wrong way. Often it's because um, we do that or we used to do that or we're afraid of doing that ourselves at some point now or in the future. So in other words, you know, we tend to see that defect, we're seeing that defect because it's within us or a variation of that defect. So 
Now, this is in relation to things that don't hurt other people, right? We're just talking about things about other people that we find um, distasteful or incompatible, to use that word again. So when you start to see faults in other people that make you not like them or make you not want to work with them, you have to put you have to put the brakes on to take a deep breath and you have to go inside and take a nice inventory of all the things about you that aren't perfect and that you would like other people to be understanding of and forgiving of and tolerant of. And if you do that in sincerity and honesty and authenticity, it's a very level playing field. So as many bad things as you can see in other people, see them in yourself. And as many good things you can see in yourself, see as many in other people. Yeah. If you can't see anything good in yourself, you're going to see, you're not going to be able to see good things in other people. Yes, there's one other thing we didn't discuss, which I think is super important, is how, well, we, I did touch on it, uh, how, how we, com like, how we can complement one another when we're different. Because I often joke with people, I say, well, what if everyone in the world was just like you? What would the world be like? And they say, well, there'd be no one at Mongol Artigue, that's for sure. You know, so if you, <laughs> if you, if you start to think, whoa, if everyone in the world were just like me, then, you know, everyone, everyone likes green and no one likes blue and everyone likes chapati and nobody likes puri. And, you know, it's going to be a very homogenous, bland world, isn't it? So, the fact that we may disagree or not get along is not a bad thing. It's, it's necessary because it broadens, it, it, it creates the variety, but it broadens our perspective. And I know sometimes when I disagree with someone or something, I'll listen to that person's lecture. I'll think, I have to listen to this lecture because I disagree and I want to broaden my mind. And even self-development experts sometimes say, read something you disagree with, listen to someone you disagree with. It's a great exercise because it forces you, well, ideally forces you to broaden your vision, to be able to kind of see, to just say, am I missing something here? Can I understand this better? So having people that you're incompatible with is often a blessing because of the way they see the world that you don't. And we didn't discuss the other thing, but we alluded to it is that when you disagree with someone, they act as your teacher in the sense that you have to learn how to get along with them. And you know, we've given some strategies. We're, we're talking more about the internal environment because that's really where the problem lies. But strategies to get along, they, they then become your teacher because you know, they force you to, they force you. <laughs> We're going to go through the questions in a minute, but it's distracting. Okay. And they force you to be different, be better in some way, rather than just go, I can't deal with you and go away. So we will take questions now. So we have to go to the top. And uh, Okay, so this is, uh, this is a question from Krishna. Now we have to remember what we're talking about because the questions were being. Yeah. Uh, Mahatma Prabhu, just one more thing. I think uh, if there are more questions, we can extend it uh, beyond uh, six o'clock as well. So I think feel free yeah, to okay. do that. Uh, Let's just start. Just okay. Oh. We can read them, and then if you have if you have questions, you can also raise your hand, and you can you can speak your questions, or you can speak them or put them in chat. 
Though this can happen in the devotee community, my question is more about the work situation. Sometimes we judge the other person's intent. We judge their actions and tend to distress them. Yeah. Um, have you ever heard the saying, beware of the accuser? Because when you judge someone of someone's intent, it's usually autobiographical. Well, you know, if I if I were doing what they're doing, this would be my intent. Therefore, they must have that intent. So I think that's important. That, and I just personally think it, one of the worst things we can do is judge people's motives because we don't know them, and we don't know their history. And you know, they may be having a bad day that day. And it's really hard to judge people's motives. So, it, and there's another thing. We, we're not always aware of our own motives. We're very deluded by our own motives. And we may have, we may be doing the right things for the wrong reasons. And because we're doing the right thing, we don't even notice our motives are not right. So like my wife is saying, it's always better to turn it within. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta said, if others' faults bother you, then find your own faults because that can help you. And others' faults, if you focus on them, they'll disturb you. So one, one big thing I've learned in my life is that I want to treat myself right. And one of the ways I want to treat myself right is not by dwelling on, well, what's his motive? What's his intent? How bad they are and so forth. Because I'm just destroying myself by doing that. And I'm making myself quite miserable. Now, if there's practical things you have to deal with because people's intents are hurting you or hurting others, that's a different thing. But to assume bad intent, you know, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of an imprisonment, you know, to assume everything is bad or wrong and everyone. And when you, you have more of a generous attitude and appreciative attitude, you feel, you feel so much better and you are so much better. You have anything to say on that? Okay. You want to answer the next question? This is Atulia Devidasi Dandavats. How to handle when one is on the receiving end of judgment and anger outbursts of other devotees. Oh, that's easy, Atulia. You just carry, you just carry a big jar of gulab jamans when they say, Atulia, you're so, and you put it in their mouth. Blah, 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 and you won't hear anything they say. And the problem is solved. Next question. No, John is going to answer that question. Um, one thing that I discovered, Atulia, aside from gulab jamans, which can be a temporary solution. One thing I discovered is, is that when we try to understand people, why they're judging and why they're becoming angry and so forth, are you um, you referring to your mother-in-law by chance? Anyway, mother-in-laws sometimes um, <laughs> have outbursts of anger <laughs> and make judgments. So um, I'm going to use the word compassion in a very broad sense. And what does compassion mean? In this sense, compassion means understanding the person understanding why they're making the judgments. And the reasons may all be, be not, they may not be benevolent reasons. They may be all wrong reasons, but understanding why they would make the wrong reasons. What's, what is their history? What is the circumstance they're in? What are their concerns? What are their needs right now? What are their anxieties? You could call that kind of a compassionate empathy. And what I've found in my own life is if you approach difficulties that way, it kind of neutralizes, not kind of, it does neutralize. It's like, like I say, compassion is the salve on the burn of what you're talking about. You're being burned by these things, but compassion is the salve. So why are they being judgmental? Maybe somebody's judging them. Maybe they grew up being judged and that's what they're doing now. Maybe they have low self-esteem and that's how they build it up. If you if you understand it, it's it's not generally malicious. 
It's just that they are struggling with their own issues. Obviously, if someone's always becoming angry, they're dealing with issues. And so if you can, if you can sympathize to some degree that, oh, they must be struggling with a lot of things and, and don't take it personally, then you won't get affected by it. And you may be in a, a very good position to help them, you know, when they get angry and said, you know, seems like something's really bothering you today. Can we talk about it? Instead of you saying, you hurt me, that's not fair. How, you, how dare you deal with me this way? You know, they get angry and say, you know, are you having a hard day today? Would you like to talk? Is there anything I can do? It seems like something's really bothering you. So you can approach it that way. And if it's a constant thing, I would suggest trying to understand why they're in that state. I know, I, I don't know if this is a mother-in-law situation, but I know one thing about mother-in-laws and about parents in general, even sometimes gurus, we expect our disciples, we expect our children to, to treat us the way we treated our parents. But generations are different, right? And so sometimes the mother-in-law expects you to treat her the way she treated her mother-in-law. But now we're, you know, three or four decades later and things are different or five decades later, it's possible. So when you understand that and you think, oh, now I know why she's like that because that's what she did and that's what she expects of us. And she's, she doesn't realize that, you know, we're raised in a different culture. We don't think that way. So that will help. And I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't ask again, you want to do this one? Want me to read it? How to not fall into the trap of justifying your mistake when self-introspecting. Vaisheshika Prabhu often says, um, I live to be corrected. So you remember I was explaining about blame? So Blame is creating an excuse, putting an excuse on a person. So, so if you understand what happens when you do that, you'll stop doing it. Because when you're making an excuse, you basically just have given up any possibility of understanding the problem and solving it. Because the excuse means it's not your problem. You're, you're not wrong. And and I would I would say, I would say. The problem itself is not the excuse you make. That is a problem, but the real problem is that the need to make the excuse. So, like, what are you running from that you're making an excuse? Are you you having difficulty admitting your fault in the matter? Like, why are you having difficulty admitting the fault? Why are you resistant? To, to acknowledge that it was your mistake. All these, all these things you have to look at because there's a whole net within your consciousness of, of things going on that can contribute to the need to make excuse. But just understand that excuses are arguments for your failure. As long as you're making an excuse, you don't take action to correct yourself because you have an excuse to say it's not my fault. So if it's not your fault, you can't do anything. In the forgiveness workshop, we do a little skit and we give someone some keys. And the keys represent my choice to forgive. And I give those keys to the person who hurt me. And I say, it's your fault that I'm resentful. But if you will apologize to me, then I'll forgive you. So they have the keys now to my forgiveness. And on, until they apologize, I can't forgive. So now I'm stuck. I can't do anything unless they forgive. Unless they say, I'm sorry, I did the wrong thing. So you don't want to put yourself in a position where you can't take control and make choices about how you want to feel and act and respond. But if you make excuses, well, I can only forgive when they apologize. Well, what if they don't apologize? What if they don't think they did anything wrong? Then what do you do? You resent them your whole life. And so again, it goes back to that point of how we torment ourselves by, by these things. And I, I've understood this so clearly from teaching forgiveness that we are our worst tormentors. So 
if somebody mistreats me and someone will say, well, are you going to take that? And I'll say, yeah, because I don't want to dwell on it. I don't want to treat myself with the anger that I could have towards this person. I'd rather just let it go and be peaceful and be Krishna conscious and not worry about it. So I think those are some, oh, okay. Um, just a simple answer to this question is that, you know, if you're in the habit of justifying your mistakes, then you should be able to justify the other person's mistakes too. <laughs> and then maybe you'll stop justifying your own so much. Better you justify them. Well, yeah, that's a good one. I like that. Easier, easier to justify your own than justify theirs, right? Okay, we have the next one from Chaitamayi, who says, this is super insights, thank you so much. What should be the approach of a wife whose husband constantly meditated and talks about his wife's anarthas? Is this habit incurable? We will defer to the marriage expert to answer this question. It's curable if he's willing to cure them. Yeah, he has to um, well, acknowledge it first. Acknowledge it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I always encourage couples who are not happy in their marriage to get professional support. And a lot of, not a lot of times, but sometimes, especially the husbands are resistant to that because it makes them think that you know, there's something wrong with them, that they're less than. But, um, you know, people don't come into this world knowing how to have good relationships. Very few people do. So um, there's nothing wrong if your marriage needs a tune-up or if you're butting heads and you're not able to communicate and, you um, you know, things are not going well and you're nervous and worried and and feeling isolated and alone and lonely and scared and sad. I mean, these are just really normal human feelings that come along with navigating way through a relationship and lots and lots of couples get help. And it's amazing how a little help can um, give you such incredible relationship gains and how this kind of habit, if you will, um, can just be turned around with a few understandings to under by knowing uh, by gaining a few skills and tools that um, you can apply immediately. So, um, you know, I'd have to talk with you another time to give you personally some skills that you might use in the approach with your husband, but ideally, you know, the couple would come together and, and learn how, you know, he may not be aware of how much it's destroying you and ultimately the relationship. And if there's children, ultimately the family, because the children see how the parents treat each other and they take that in. And then that's generally how they treat their partners too. So this is something that gets carried on from generation to generation and it's very detrimental and, and um, has really could have devastating effects. So um, yeah, the issue is you, the issue is him and the issue is both of you. And um, Mahatma Fru is typing in my email address now, if you want to write me for further counseling. Anybody. Can. Yeah. Anybody. If you're having, like, like John has said, if you're having serious problems in a marriage, marriage counseling is is very, very powerful. And obviously, a man who's always criticizing his wife is a very frustrated person. And um, through marriage counseling, it not only benefits the relationship, but it benefits the individuals because it's it's introspective. They they start to have to see why they're doing these things. So that's uh, 
It's really good. So if anyone's interested, just write John Yvonne. And um, also, I just want to give you my website because I mentioned we have a forgiveness course. Um, uh, Prabhu, a, yes. Uh, the opportunity and ask you, is it possible we can do that forgiveness course with Iskand Vastan? I mean, I, I'm not saying it has to be, but kindly let us know if what, what, what it well, is. Well, see, need. the problem is I would need like 12 hours, 15 hours, and everything is everything is online. Okay. Why don't you go online and check it out? And if you think you'd rather have it live, then we could discuss. You know, we'd have to take two days okay. or 12 weeks or something, 12 weeknights or something like that. Okay. Um, but if you go to my website, yeah, I think somewhere on the bottom, it will take you to a link that links to the course. And then we just do it on a donation basis. So, you, you know, just take it. If you like it, if you benefited, you can give a donation. It helps us produce more courses. And um, I'm starting to do more online courses because I can only teach so many people. And we've just finished a course, which is um, geared towards people who are just becoming devotees, who need to learn the basics. So if you're interested in that course, let me know. I think it's, you know, we created it for all the temples. As soon as someone joins, and they need to know about how to practice Krishna consciousness, how to improve their job, uh, how to associate and so forth. So oh, that's exciting. Is it also there on the website? The same that the that the big just developed, and we created a new website for this. So, if you're interested, just send me an email, and then I will investigate where that is. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Oh yeah! So, um, we have a court. We have a court. My, my wife's doing a course on marriage. If any of you're interested, she'll tell you about. It. So I have a, a course called The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. It's in three parts, and I'll be teaching part one um, on February 28th online at 10 a.m. That's a Sunday, and it's through the Bhakti Center in New York. So if you go on their website and then you click on um, the courses and the um, workshops, upcoming courses and workshops, and you scroll down, you'll see the advertisement for that course. I'm gonna to try to get the link for that. And um, it's for couples. So you both have to come and it's really fun. There's lots of exercises and you get to spend quality time together and you learn a lot of really valuable key skills that you can start applying to your relationship to make it better. And there's lots of introspection and like the woman who asked about the husband with the anarthas of criticism, that would come up in such a big way in this course. You know, one of, one of the great lessons I learned is that, you know, a lot of times people think, well, I'll go to a marriage course if my marriage is really, really bad and we have a lot of problems or it's about to end, or I'll go to some course or something to make myself better if I have a lot of problems. But that's not what successful people do. Successful people learn how to be more successful. So the course is not just if you have a problem in your marriage or bad marriage. If you're on a level five in your marriage, you'll get up to seven or eight. If you're on a seven or eight, you'll get up to 10. If you're on a level one, you'll get up to four. So successful people are always educating themselves. It's not just, I have a problem, so I'll do this. I'm not good in communication, so I'll take this communication course. No, I wanna be an expert at everything, so I'm gonna learn. So I think that's important to understand because I think a lot of people, when they hear about forgiveness course, marriage course, or this or that, they're thinking, well, you know, I don't really have big issues. But when you take the course, you realize there's so many things I didn't know that are so helpful. And when people take the forgiveness course, they go, oh, I don't really have such an issue. And they realize that, no, they had a lot of issues that they suppressed. <laughs> and when they had a look at them, they realized, oh, this was a lot worse than I thought. And 
also in the forgiveness course, there's so many things you learn that surround forgiveness that are extremely transformational. So it's not only just about forgiveness, but forgiveness is such a high consciousness. To be forgiving, you have to be compassionate. You have to be empathetic. You have to understand how your karma is your teacher. You have to understand how people who hurt you are your teacher. There's so many things you learn. So that's been my experience personally, that just keep educating yourself because you're just one bit of information away from you're making your marriage like hugely better. You're one bit of information for making your heart more clean, more forgiving, you know? And if you have to sit through three hours or however it is long as it is, or three days, and you only learn one thing, but that one thing makes a huge difference in your life, it was worth it, right? So I think that's important to understand because you might be thinking, well, it's okay, and I'm not married. If you're not married, you should definitely take this course. Oh, oh, it's for couples, yeah. All right, well, if you're, oh yeah, if you have somebody, then you can take it. But um, just trying to expand the, the concept of education. Hey, okay. So, <laughs> I think we have to end class and you still have questions, right? Well, Badahari's here. No, he can answer the questions. He can let him answer the question. Okay, Badahari's here. He's going to answer the next question. <laughs> he wasn't prepared for it, but. Please have him, Prabhu. We will Boston. be honored. This is Boston. Boston. Okay, I'm signing off. Okay, John was saying time. goodbye. Uh, Bye. We welcome you at ISKCON Boston. Uh, From core of our heart. Please accept our gratitude and our humble actually, business. I don't know if there's any more questions. Uh, <laughs> I think we answered all the questions. Uh, okay. Hi, Krishna Prabhu. I have a question. Okay, who are you? Where are you? Um, Radha. Radha. Oh, on the okay, Radha Bishwas, Bengali. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Monache. Okay. Let's hear the question. So when when we have competitions like between friends, uh, we get discomfort, which is. I do not like having discomfort and we have like a lot of anxiousness if we're going to win the contest or not, not in real contest, but in like, if that person goes over me and something, how to overcome and deal with that. Uh, how old are you, Radha? But I'm going to answer the question. <laughs> what? Ten and a half. Yeah. You come to my Japa workshop, right? Yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how does a 10 and a half year old overcome the anxiety caused by competition? Is that the question? <laughs> that you might lose? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Like they'll get better than me and then I'll just. And speak. then what happens? And then what happens? Do you cry? You'll cry the rest of the day. No. That I'm, <laughs> that that I mean. I don't like being bullied. They'll make fun oh. of me. Oh, yeah, right. Um, I have a good solution. You want to hear it? Go back to Godhead. It won't happen there. <laughs> You're describing typical behavior of kids, isn't it? Okay. I will give you a mantra. You know this mantra? Sticks and stones can break my bones, but names can never hurt me. You, words. Words can never hurt me. Yeah. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. You don't know that mantra? I mean, I've heard of it, but... <laughs> Which is? Sticks, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words really hurt. <laughs> <laughs> this was... A, the, it was a mantra we, the, the girls would say when they would tease one another. They go, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never, just to like say, you can bully me, but it's not going to bother me. The, um, you know, Radha, you know who should answer that question? I think you should. So I'm going to turn that question back to you. And I'm going to say, 
I want you to answer that question. You don't have to answer it now, but I want you to think about it. And then I want you to answer it. And the next time we do a Japa workshop, you tell me your answer, or you can email it to me. Because I think you will come up with the answer, and the answer you come up will be the best answer. Okay. You'll come up okay. with a great answer. You'll come up with a great answer. I One Japa session we did for kids, I asked them a question, and they all... They had the perfect answer in one second. And I think if I would have asked adults, it would have, they kind of would have beat around the bush a bit, taken longer. Okay. I think that's Thank it. You. You're welcome. Okay. I hope that helps you to some degree, create a better community. Yes, Dear Prabhu. Uh, this is the last chance. If anyone has any questions, uh, please kindly uh, unmute yourself and ask. Uh, all questions answered. Thank you, Mahatma Das and uh, Janvi Mataji for a very helpful workshop. And Our Parahari Prabhu, Parahari Prabhu, mm -hmm. it's great to see you. Hey, Krishna. Nice. Hey, Krishna. Yeah. Write my wife, she'll help you a lot. Okay. Hi, Paul. Thank uh, you, everyone. Yes. Yes. Thank you, uh, dear Prabhu. I take this opportunity on behalf of entire ISKCON Boston congregation. I express my deepest gratitude at your lotus feet and also to uh, Her Grace Janwa Mataji. Uh, we are indeed very grateful to both of you for giving your precious time and your valuable association and advice to uh, to all of us and we pray that we again get an opportunity to hear from you in future thank you Shala Prabhupada ki dear Bada Hari Prabhu uh, maybe we would also like to uh, uh, get an opportunity to hear from you at some point of time sure okay sure Temple looks quite cold. Uh, yes, no, it's, it's very cold. Namaste, Saraswati Deve, God of Wani Pratari, Nevishesha Shunyavadi, Pachata Desha Tari, Namaste, Jai Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gora Bhattavinda Sadhana, Shiva, Sadhana, 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 
Shankha Vade Ganta Vade Mother, Mother, Mother Vade Ganta Vade Ganta Vade Shanka Bhaje Ganta Bhaje Mother, Mother, Mother Bhaje Bahu Koti Chandra Jini Badana Udwala
Thank you all devotees for joining the Sunday lecture. We'll meet again next Saturday for the Bhagavatam class in the morning and Saturday night Kirtan in the evening. Thank you. Hare Krishna.